It's time for munching. And mating. In the Macrocystis or Giant Kelp. With your host, Dr. Bill Bushing. One of the best things about my job is that when I go to the office, I don't have to wear a tie with my suit. Wetsuit, that is. By the time I started diving California waters in the late 1960s, the giant sea bass was largely absent from our region. In fact, I didn't see my first one until the very late 1990s. Now I see them frequently each summer and fall. This is the story of these magnificent fish and their slow climb back from regional extinction. The giant sea bass was originally known as either the Jewfish or the black sea bass in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Several large groupers in other parts of the United States were also called Jewfish until that name was discontinued due to the religious connotations. The name black sea bass was changed to giant sea bass by the American Fisheries Society about 1961 because the former common name was already used for an unrelated fish on the East Coast. The scientific name, Stereolepis gigas, comes from the Greek for firm-scaled giant. It was given to this fish in 1809 by heirs who first described it scientifically. The giant sea bass was originally placed in the grouper family, Serranidae, but later moved into a new family, the temperate basses, Persichthyidae. However, its proper taxonomic position has never been fully resolved. Similarities between the larval forms of the giant sea bass and the wreckfish in the family Polyprionidae appear to support its placement with them. Historically, the giant sea bass has been reported from Humboldt Bay in Northern California south to Cabo San Lucas at the tip of Baja, California, and throughout the Gulf of California, also known as the Sea of Cortez. These fish were so common near Avalon on Santa Catalina Island that Jewfish Point was named after them. In these historic photos from Catalina's museum, you can see that they were the target of early anglers. Boats even flew giant sea bass flags when they were brought in. Giant sea bass juveniles and adults are mainly bottom dwellers. They prefer rocky reefs, kelp forests, and sand or mud flats, but are occasionally seen in open water as well. They are most commonly found over rocky bottom habitats, next to giant kelp beds, and on the edge of rocky reefs. Depths may range from 30 feet to at least 300 feet. And they often prefer areas where the bottom drops off fairly quickly into deeper water. These fish can be found well away from the reefs if searching for food in midwater or foraging over soft bottoms for squid and other food. Giant sea bass will remain at a reef even if the kelp beds disappear over time. This can happen due to severe overgrazing by sea urchins or warm water events like an El Nino. Hey, get out of the picture, small fry! Fry! Yikes! Early on, these fish were referred to as black sea bass due to the color of individuals brought back to shore for weighing and photographs. It was believed that the juvenile fish were spotted, but the mature fish were dark. It is now known that the dark color was due in large part to the fact they were dead. Divers encountering live fish underwater have observed several color variations. Giant sea bass can appear a very uniform light gray, various shades of gray with large dark spots, or a pattern exhibited by many other fish where they are light in color on the lower or ventral side and darker on the dorsal. 
This is believed to provide camouflage from predators looking down towards the dark bottom or up towards the lighter sky and surface waters. Individual giant sea bass are capable of changing their color pattern. It is thought these color changes are a form of communication between fish and or a response to stress. Giant sea bass have the usual complement of fins. There is a single, strongly notched dorsal fin with two parts. The spiny forward section is low and often retracted into a groove on the fish's back. Unlike the spiny first dorsal, the second fleshy dorsal is higher, shorter in length, and not retractable. The bass's pectoral fins, located on either side of the body, are very important while hovering. They may also be used to break as the fish comes to a stop, but are held close to the body while swimming for streamlining. The pectorals may also be held out to stabilize the fish or to turn. Fins on the lower part of the body include the paired ventral or pelvic fins below the pectoral fins and the single anal fin just below the caudal peduncle or base of the tail. The giant sea bass's powerful tail or caudal fin provides propulsion when the fish is swimming thanks to strong muscles at its base and along the flanks of the fish. This fin allows quick bursts of speed to escape from danger. At slower speeds, back and forth movement of the head indicates the tail fin is in use. The combined action of these fins allows the giant sea bass to maneuver fairly well given its large size. The fish's head is dominated by the huge mouth. As in other fish, the mouth is used for respiration as well as for feeding. It opens and closes, drawing water into the mouth cavity and passing it over the gills where oxygen is transferred to the fish's circulatory system before it exits through the gill cover or operculum, carrying with it carbon dioxide and other wastes. Although very large, the mouth contains only small teeth mostly located at the rear. These fish feed by quickly opening their mouths, creating a vacuum which draws fish and other prey in. They are therefore referred to as suction feeders. Here you see a bass take prey off the bottom as I filmed from a small submarine. These bass are exhibiting behavior that appears to be related to possible feeding activity. Usually, these fish feed at night. Because of their protected status today, it is not possible to analyze the stomach contents of live fish. Much earlier, state marine biologist John Fitch was able to inspect the stomach contents of a number of giant sea bass and gave us some useful information about their dietary preferences. The bass's diet is reported to include abalone, octopus, squid, lobster, most likely at night, mantis shrimp, bait fish like sardines and jack mackerel, especially by the young bass, 
bottom fish like CO sole and halibut, ocean whitefish, sheephead, midwater fish including blacksmith and sargo, guitar fish and small sharks like this horn shark, bat rays are apparently a delicacy although this bass must be full and they add an occasional kelp or barred sand bass for variety. Reports that they can outswim and eat bonita are probably false. Now we all know from Newton's law of gravity that what goes up must come down. However, were you aware that you and other creatures are what you eat minus what you excrete? I have learned that individual bass may defecate on bothersome divers like myself, which also provides other fish with a rather questionable meal. This giant sea bass is somewhat unusual. Notice how clean its head region is. There are very few obvious parasites on it. Unlike this individual, which has a large complement of them. Even casual observation of giant sea bass quickly reveals that they are usually covered with parasites, especially near the head region. Most of the parasites seen on these gentle giants are copepods, also referred to as sea lice. According to Dr. Milton Love, the parasitic copepods that attach to fish are often from two related groups, the genus Lepiopterus or Caligus. Hobson identified the ones that dominate the giant sea bass as Lepiopterus longipes. Here you see a male and a female of the closely related salmon sea louse. The long white strands on the female are egg sacs. Off Catalina's leeward coast, these parasites are often cleaned from the bass by young sheephead. Fixed cleaning stations are more prominent in the tropics, where many fish species visit them to have cleaner fish and invertebrates like shrimp remove parasites and diseased or dead tissue. Here in the temperate waters of the kelp forest, I see a lot of cleaning behavior, but it is generally not at fixed locations. Senorita, rock wrasse, and other cleaning fish can be observed doing their work mid-water or just over the bottom. One possibility was to take advantage of food scraps when the bass feed. Another option is linked to the behavior of the cleaning fish. Based on my observations, cleaners focus much of their effort along the fins and body of the fish. The sheephead will clean bass over most parts of their body. They often focus on the base of the fins, the sides, and the ventral surfaces. However, they generally avoid cleaning the head region, at least close to the mouth, where they might become dinner instead of cleaners. This may explain why the parasites are so common there. Here, one sheephead chases another away from the bass. Which occasionally has to break up these fights. Other common cleaners associated with the giant sea bass include the senorita, and the island kelpfish, which is a primary cleaner off Anacapa Island. I have even seen kelp bass appear to clean them, although they seem much more cautious.
Off Anacapa Island to the north, fixed cleaning stations have been identified, perhaps because the primary cleaner fish involved, the island kelpfish, is more strongly reef associated. From the behavior filmed here, you can see the giant sea bass also rub their bodies against algae, kelp, and the bottom, apparently to remove parasites if cleaners aren't present. One interesting interaction that I have observed several times is when schools of jack mackerel follow a swimming bass. At first I thought they were just slipstreaming to save energy. Until I filmed them close up and realized they were rubbing their bodies on the rough, scaly sides of the bass. I have seen similar behavior between jack mackerel and soup fin sharks off Catalina. This behavior may serve to rub parasites off the mackerel thanks to the rough skin of the bass and the sharks. Often giant sea bass are seen hovering over the bottom during the day since much of their activity is nocturnal. Even well-trained DIR divers could learn something about buoyancy control from these magnificent fish. Giant sea bass themselves are likely eaten by a variety of fish and marine mammals when they are small. But as they grow large, only man and large sharks can eat them. I believe their daytime behavior of hovering mostly near the bottom may also be a defense against attacks by great whites or other large predators. Great whites are known to attack from below and there just isn't a lot of maneuvering room to do so if the bass is hovering a few feet off the bottom. Until great whites learn to bury in the sands and attack from there the bass, and I, should be safe. Hovering may also be a way of avoiding strong currents and minimizing energy expenditure. The following sequences show some interesting behavior I have observed. Note that these bass appear to lean over while swimming and hovering. In addition, movements of the mouth are common including the yawn which probably serves to back flush the gills. I was lucky enough to capture this one up close and personal.
The yawning behavior even appears to be contagious as you can see here. Reminds me of my students during one of my classroom lectures. Giant sea bass may also bark to communicate a warning to one another. Although it is audible underwater, my camera could not capture the sound. In the next episode, we will focus on the giant sea bass's mating behavior, scientific research, and conservation efforts by the state of California to ensure their continued presence in our giant kelp forests. Stay tuned!